So thanks a lot, Chakra, and uh, thank you all for being here. So uh, this actually is some work I did with Yang Lu when I was in the Department of Medicine. And um, what essentially call it is nanoscale nuclear architecture mapping, which is an optical approach. And uh, we apply it towards cancer risk uh, stratification and prediction. So um, this is the brief uh, outline of the talk. So I'll start by the motivation, what we are doing, why we are doing it. So I'll spend some time here. Then there'll be a brief interlude of, about implementation in terms of optics, what we do. And then finally, I'll move on to the results of some published results, some which are unpublished, and some which are very preliminary. But sort of hint at something which might be feasible later on, we'll see. And uh, these results will be in the context of mouse model uh, in colorectal carcinogenesis so in the, and in the setting of inflammation and the inflammatory bowel disease, which is the chronic inflammation of your digestive tract. So if you have any questions, please stop me and ask. So um, carcinogenesis, as you all know, is a multifactorial process. So, but it sort of can be divided into three stages. So in the initiation phase or stage, you have normal cells going from normal to this initiated or altered state because of an imbalance in this process here due to genetic mutations, epigenetic changes, and all that. And then from the initiated stage to the pre-neoplastic uh, stage, you have this change happening, either the proliferation of clonal populations, or you have the inhibition of apoptosis. That is, you have um, an inhib um, basically programmed cell death sort of stops. So, okay, so this is the promotion stage. But finally, if you want to go from these pre-neoplastic changes to neoplastic, that is malignant changes, you need this stage where molecular and cellular changes happen. So you finally go from you know, benign to malignant. And then eventually, under certain conditions, you can get tumor and stuff. So uh, for a pathologist, when basically a pathologist, oh, let me go back a bit, looks at these particular you know, neoplastic changes and the tumor, for him on, or her on a pathology slide, they see alterations in the tissue architecture, and specifically they see alterations in the epithelial cell nuclear architecture. So they might see increased cell nucleus size, they might see irregularity, they might see coarse chromat uh, chromatin pattern, or they might also see some prominence of the nucleoli. So it basically starts all in the epithelial nuclei. And um, so let me go back a bit. Also, in the pre-neoplastic stage, when you have dysplasia and dysplastic effects, that too pathologists can tell very well from you know, simple H&E images looking at under the microscope. So pathology under a microscope using H&E staining remains the gold standard, despite you know, all the progress which has been made. And of course, now with FDA approving digital pathology, so you can have image analysis and all that stuff, so you can increase the throughput and all that. Shikhar, yeah. when you show images like this to the pathologist, was, they, uh, was there any time where you said, which portions of this image is pre-neoplastic, which portion? So uh, this one is, is a tumor, basically, so this entire image. Yeah. But what we look at, actually, <laughs> is not when the tumor or neoplastic changes have happened. What we actually focus on are these changes where the cells actually appear to be normal. So that is what our interest is. And so of course, a pathologist can tell areas. If you show them the whole slide, they can tell, OK, you know, these are tumor-rich regions. Here it looks normal and stuff like that. So they're able to. So uh, of course, uh, these changes or these, um, you know, um, this image was taken under a microscope, which is micron scale or micrometer scale. But the question which we were interested in asking was, what about patients which are at risk of developing cancer? They have not yet developed cancer. They haven't gone from the, gone into the malignancy, but they are still in this pre-neoplastic, this hazy stage. So where, if you look at the epithelial nuclei, they are normal appearing to a pathologist, histologically speaking. So the question is, can we, from these normal appearing epithelial cells, say anything about future progression of cancer or cancer development in patients by looking at these normal? So the question is, why do we want to do it? So this is 
one clinical context we look at. So this talk essentially focuses on this particular <coughs> clinical context of inflammatory bowel disease. So this is a disorder involving uh, the chronic inflammation of the digestive tract. So we focus especially in the colon, so the large intestine. So the thing to note here is that if you look, so this was a study or a review actually published in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. And if you look at the incidence rate of IBD, so that means one, approximately, one per 100,000 patient years, you have a person developing cancer. Although these many people actually of IBD cases arise every year. So the question is, can we, by looking at these patients, predict which this person would be? And uh, so this is the question we want to answer, because if we are not able to do this, all these patients undergo colonoscopy, which can be invasive, expensive, lead to lower compliance, worse patient outcome. So the question is, without aggressive surveillance, so based on whatever colonoscopy the uh, clinicians are already doing, can we say anything about, about this transition, this progression? Can we predict it? So our answer to that is this optical approach, which we call nanoscale nuclear architecture mapping, which is an optical approach, but it optically computes certain properties of the nuclear architecture. And uh, I will talk about that. So when we think in terms of optics, especially physical optics, the way we think of, say, a cell or the nucleus within a cell is in terms of its refractive index. And this refractive index essentially is a fundamental property of this matter. It arises from light matter interaction. So essentially when you have these incident waves, incident on an atom, the electrons undergo small oscillations, which are described by this model. And this, of course, is an approximation of a quantum mechanical model. But in the biological context we work in, it's, it is perfectly valid. And um, I think I won't go into what exactly it is, but what it boils down to is that it has two terms. One is this real term, which is here, and one is an imaginary term, which is here. And these two together define this refractive index, which where omega is the optical frequency or wavelength, if you can think in terms of that. And when you look at this uh, quantity at every location here, you get this particular term. Right? Now, this term, the first term, the real term, is what we actually normally call refractive index. It measures the optical density and things like that. The second term is what we call absorption coefficient. So if you stain a sample, that staining would be represented, and the so and if you shine a light through it, some light will get absorbed, and that will be represented by this term. So what we are in nanonam interested in is quantifying this particular term, right? So um, if you follow this principle of physical optics, there are some approaches which have been developed, actually a lot of them have been developed. And so this is an example which I took from PNAS of a red blood cell, a phase contrast image of it, which is characterizing its nuclear density, basically this thing, in terms of its phase contrast, right? And this is an image which we generated using nanonam uh, of an optically sectioned sample, a tissue sample. So again, the grayscale values here represent the changes which are happening in that particular optical section, and, and I'll explain what I mean by those changes. So, um, okay, so back up a bit. So this is refractive index. So how does nanonam use this property in order to quantify properties of the nucleus? So the way nanonam sees it is that, so suppose you have some tissue sample, this is sort of a cartoon image, actually it's a DAPI stain, so it's fluorescence. So actually it doesn't work here, but I just put it there as a placeholder. So um, you have a tissue sample, and this tissue sample can be thought of comprising of these refractive index profiles, which are along the Z direction, right? So you have these, and Nanonam imagines this profile, but what it is able to see is the gradient of this refractive index profile, which is the reflection profile, which actually is given by that term. It is the log uh, of the derivative of the log of refractive index, but actually doesn't affect the results too much. And then when Nanonam decides to probe the sample, it set, uh, sends down a light wave. Actually, it uses a broadband source, so multiple wavelengths go in. 
and they are reflected from various points across this uh, depth based on the gradient which they see. So this is a reflection mode system, right? And um, this, uh, the red dots here actually indicate the optical pathway, but it's not relevant here. So essentially you're probing the sample, you're getting reflections back. So you are quantifying this reflection profile, which quantifies the refractive index, but you quantify it in the optical space. That is in the optical path length space. I don't know if that makes any sense, but here the distances are measured as a function of refractive index. So you're basically doing a space transformation. And you do it for different wavelengths. So what you collect is spectral data, right? And then we perform some Fourier transformations, some other things where no heuristics are involved. And what we eventually get is this particular quantity, okay? So this arises by looking at the phase of the, of the Fourier transform I talked about here. This quantity is the measurement which results from a nano now. And the result is Fourier transformed. The phase of that term, we proved, uh, it was quite an uh, extensive thing, but what we get, the, the phase of that gives us what we call depth resolved optical path difference at every 3D location. So if you go back here, we were just looking at one profile, but we could look at all these XY locations and we get the entire profile. And that is what you call depth resolve optical path difference. And this was an animation that somehow to stop. So in any case, you get a 3D characterization of the nucleus. So um, what is this characterization? Essentially, it has two terms, this delta Z and the SI term. Now this term, um, not to get too technical, is an anti-symmetric term. So if you're looking at any depth, a slight averaging around that depth, you lose this. What you're left with is this SI term, which characterizes the shape of your refractive index profile. So this is what DROPD, which is depth resolved optical path difference, is capturing. Okay. And it is doing a every XYZ uh, location, and this is what nanonam measures. And it does it with nanoscale uh, sensitivity. So I will talk about uh, nanoscale sensitivity a bit later, but let's first talk about, so I'm saying that quantifies 3D alterations of 3D structure. So what exactly is it? Just quick, what is that just a wavelength which you get Yeah, so this is a property of matter. We don't touch this. This is just to show that oh. refractive index arises from here. Okay. So we can't do anything. But in here, are there things that are known and unknown? So for example, epsilon naught must be known. Epsilon naught is yeah. actually known, yeah. which is the permittivity yeah. of vacuum. Yeah. Uh, what we are trying to measure is actually this term here, epsilon. which epsilon. Right. So the ratio here defines the electrical susceptibility. So that is the term we are interested in. It arises due to this, but we can't really measure this. So what we are measuring actually is a function of this. So this exists and we perform a function on it, a functional, basically, a functional transform. And then uh, after yeah. measuring epsilon, yeah. uh, uh, and in the next slide, in the how next. did it become... Uh, so, so basically, yeah. epsilon is something we are interested in. Yeah. This epsilon here essentially is decomposed into this. It is yeah. the same thing. Yeah, really so basically, yeah. this refractive index is that term. Oh, no, no, yeah, is, exactly. It is exactly that, because we are not assuming any magnetism to be present in biological samples. So it is exactly this. And it decomposes into this term and that term. And we are interested in characterizing this term. So when we talk about such a sample, so I'm assuming the sample is unstained here. and you probe it, what the, the results which you'll get would characterize this term here. But it'll be a function of that. It won't get exact that thing, but a function of that. So that is what DROPD characterizes. It characterizes a function of that refractive index, actually. And uh, so this is sort of an optical section rendering of the same thing of multiple nuclei. So, so what it exactly does, there are two things it does. So again, we go back to a 1D refractive index profile. This is the axial depth. Uh, I've written it in terms of optical depth, but you can think in terms of physical depth. Um, if we take the refractive index and increase it slightly in some locations, right? 
So this is an increase in optical density, increase in condensation effects, if you want to think biologically about it. And this is a very small increase, which typical microscopes will not be able to capture because it's below their resolution and their sensitivity both. And I'll come back to those two ideas later. And the other, so this is a localized change which we are inducing. And if there is, a, and there's another kind of change, which I'm calling localized heterogeneity, which essentially is around a particular depth, you see a lot of variation. So a lot of irregularity in the structure of that particular location. So, so basically two, an increase in optical density, concentration effects, and changes in, localized changes in the variations of what those nuclear patterns are doing. So if you have irregular structure, you will see this kind of effect in terms, in optically speaking, of a biological you know, substance. And Nanonam is able to capture, at least the principle of it, is able to capture these two changes at those two depths. So you see it's depth resolved. At those two depths, you see a small change. And I'll show actual results a bit later. So, but you are able to capture these two effects in Nanonam. And I don't know of any other approach yet in especially physical optics or any light related which is able to do this. So this will be the focus of uh, what um, we are trying to do. So this change, what we've, I think it's stopped working. Oh, yeah. So this uh, change is what's associated with increase in optical density, chromatin condensation, and stuff like that. And this change is associated with irregularity in shape and things like that. So if we are getting some result, which if these two things increase, you see an uptick in the value which we're calculating. Again, you see these are very small values here. You know, they're nanometer scale. So what is a hypothesis? A hypothesis is that if we look at patients which have a risk of progression to cancer, so IBD patients in the setting of inflammation, which have a risk of progression to cancer, our hypothesis is that if... Sure. Yeah, yeah. If um, we look at that DROPD, which we have, and we plot its histogram, so this is for a particular patient. We took all its nuclei and we generated a summary statistics, which I'll talk about later. I just wanted to give the hypothesis here. So if you take this, you see a rightward shift in this DROPD profile for high-risk patients. Now, of course, you'll see a lot of overlap between the two, and this is fundamental to cancer, cancer heterogeneity, you know, biological, that you don't get a very distinct separation, especially given the fact this data was generated from epithelium cells, normal appearing epithelium cells, so they don't have any dysplasia yet. They don't have dysplastic effects yet. They're indefinite for dysplasia. So you, you don't see that. So this is a hypothesis that it should shift based on our previous results, which was that. So um, sort of stepping back, and I mentioned nanoscale uh, sensitivity. The idea there is that if you have a microscope, and it is diffraction limited, so it has a diffraction limited resolution of that much, generally the resolution and the sensitivity go together. So if you're not able to resolve the thing, you are not sensitive to the changes which are happening you know, within that structure. So if you're doing fluorescent microscopy, you see a blob, you say, okay, it's a, it's a blob. You, know, you can't say much about it. That's why you have super resolution imaging and all of those sorts of stuff. So where you can go down to maybe you know, 30 or 50 nanometers. But in nanonam, we are able to decouple these two ideas. So we are able to, so we can still use a diffraction limited st uh, spot but we are sensitive to the change which happens within this diffraction limited spot. Okay. So, and this was a study which we did in order to show, because it's very hard to capture this idea. So here what we did was we took a sample, the same sample, and we measured it with, you know, under different acquisition times. So basically creating different SNR conditions, signal to noise ratio conditions. And we would expect the sample to or the, the measurements which we are making to be constant. So we measure, differentially measure those, and we find that it's basically around a nanometer, max, say two nanometers. So the good thing about our approach is, because we are doing this Fourier transform, if we get a signal which is above this, we can definitely say it's a signal, not noise. So it is a property of the biological substance and not a random noise or artifact which we measure. So 
given that, a brief interlude on how we do it, so this will be quick. So uh, NanoNAM basically is a three module system. So we start with um, a formal and fixed paraffin embedded uh, tissue block. And I think I went a bit too fast, or maybe too fast. And then we take that uh, uh, formal and fixed paraffin embedded block, deparaffinize it, mount it on a slide, and image that slide using our NAP. So this is the system, and I won't go into the optics here, but this is a reflection mode, uh, you know, low coherence optical microscope, which is a take on uh, Fourier domain optical coherence tomography. But it does the measurements which I have talked about up to now. And we do it on unstained samples. So the question is, why not use stained samples like, you know, h &E images? Image them so you have information about what's going on. The reason is that generally when you do h &E staining, you have a difference in, you know, stain uptakes. You know, even if you fall exactly the same preparation, you'll get variations in uptake. And what it does is that it, so you remember these two terms we had. So when you have staining and you shine a light on it, it gets absorbed. So it affects this term. What we're interested in is that term, if you remember. So however, in, uh, through electromagnetics and some causal relations, change here has a direct effect on nuclear refractive index. So if you see, if I change the absorption coefficient, what you see is an effect on the refractive index. So it has a linear relationship, and we want to avoid that. So basically, we un when we do nanonam measurements, we use unstained samples. Even with the changes in the third. Yeah, because the thing is that the refractive index, this is a pretty huge change, because the changes we which you're measuring are at that order, actually. So, um, so after doing this thing, we stain it, and then we use, this, use the second module of nanonam, where we image the stained samples, and here where we do expert segmentation and all that stuff. And then the last module is this contrast phase microscope, which registers this image which we had to the nanonam measurements, because they were unstained, so it's very hard to make out, because those changes are really small, but the contrast is not huge, so we cannot really align them. So we need sort of this in-between step to do it. And when you combine these two, what you get is this 3D architectural map. Right? OK, so from this map, we essentially, so we have that. So what we did was two things. We did, uh, one was we looked at uh, the summary statistics. And the other was the extension, sort of keeping this multidimensional, multi-feature sort of characteristic of uh, 3D uh, DROPT. Um, characterization of uh, refractive index. So a lot of our published work is related to this, which I'll talk about, and some of the unpublished is related to this mean DROPD vector where we sort of, so this is the depth, we sort of average at each of the depths to create this sort of vector. And some preliminary results are related to something about spectral decomposition and uh, linear nonlinear manifolds. So um, here what happened, so now we go back to, so to, we have a hypothesis and everything ready. So the question is, coming back to a clinical context, we want to see if we can do risk stratification, we can see or identify the progression, and we can predict it and things of that nature. Okay, so we start with this AOM DSS model. So it's a well-established mouse model of colorectal cancer. And... Um, so here, basically, you have got two agents, the chemical agents. So the inflammatory agent is dextran sulfate sodium DSS, and you've got a carcinogen, which is azoxymethane, which is AOM. And so essentially, it models cancer development using that in the background of chronic inflammation, which is what happens in IBD patients, right? So based on these two sort of agents, we divide our mice basically into these four groups. The first one is normal DSS. So they're normal mice, but they have been uh, treated with inflammatory agent, right? So what we get are histologically normal appearing nuclei, epithelial nuclei, with chronic inflammation without any dysplasia. Then we take, you know, the mice again, but now along with treating it with DSS, we treat it with the carcinogen to AOL. 
and what you get are histologically normal appearing nuclei with chronic inflammation that eventually develop dysplasia. But we analyzed normal appearing nuclei. And these two are sort of sanity checks which we added, which are low-grade dysplasia, so we look at dysplastic cells, and high-grade dysplasia, so, well, you know, this, these are malignant. So uh, the thing based on our, or at least based on hypothesis, is that what we would like to see is them being graded, you know, sort of showing this right grid shift. So before I show you that, here is the... Um, you know, the h &E image of this. And then when we perform nanonam, we, you know, we segment it and all. And what we get uh, is like that. And if you see, so actually I should back up a bit. Again, we are looking at normal epithelium, normal epithelium for in inflammation, inflammation plus carcinogen or, or carcinogen, right? And what we see is the DROPD, which we are measuring. So we want to see this condensation effect, this aggregation, this coarseness. And you see these values going up as compared to what we have here. Of course, there are regions here where you see the same thing. But on average, what you see here is a distinct, you know, this aggregation effect. So what we did was we created some summary histograms of those. So for each mice, we had about, I don't know, 500 nuclei or something. We analyzed all of them. And if so, if you look, so we have those four subgroups. So if you start from left to right, those four subgroups align nicely. So you see a rightward shift. So here, what I'm talking about, actually, this should be DROPD, but in any case, um, this is the same thing, which I showed before. Um, so, so this is mean DROPD, and we also calculated the entropy of the same uh, property which we are measuring. So this is the average, this is the entropy. And in both cases, we see a rightward shift in the histogram. Again, you see overlaps between all of them. But I think that's nature in general. You can't expect all of them to separate out really nicely. And, but the key thing here is we are talking about cancer progression. And if you look at the first, first two on the left, the blue one is normal with inflammation. And this pinkish purple thing is normal with AOM DSS. You see a shift, a progression to these more known, pathologically known malignant states. And the same thing here. So we sort of combined all of this in a scatter plot just to show what is happening. And we see, so again, this is the normal. This is normal uh, with you know inflammation plus carcinogen. And you see a progression of these to these two states they sort of align really nicely. So um, then we moved on to, okay, so we had some sort of a validation with the mouse model. So we said, okay, what happens if you look at patients? So we did a retrospective study. So where we took 18 patients, and um, 18 patients which were low risk, and 15 patients which were high risk. Low risk means that they did not show any high-grade dysplasia or cancer after 13 years of follow-up. So this is retrospective, so you have the luxury to do it. Um, and these 15 eventually did develop some sort of cancer or high-grade dysplasia. Uh, we did all sorts of, you know, removal of confounding factors in terms of age matching, sample age, because this is a retrospective study, so the samples are archived, so you have to make sure that age and the gender, and so all that was matched. And again, we look now at Normal, normal colon epithelial nuclei in an ulcerative uh, colitis patient, which is a type of IBD which affects your colon and uh, rectum. So um, chronic inflammation. Um, so yeah, who did not develop uh, uh, cancer after seven years. And in this case, they eventually did develop cancer. And again, if we zoom into, we're zooming into one part, but this is true throughout. Again, you see this condensation effect, which is present in, you know, in, in the two cases, looking at epithelial nuclei, normal appearing. So at this stage, we do not know that they will eventually develop something. So we are able to sort of, and again, this, these are sort of summarizing the histograms for all the 18 and 15 patients. And if you look at low risk, and if you look at high risk, you see there is a rightward shift. Again, a lot of overlap but there's a distinct uh, rightward shift. 
And again, if you look at the scatter plot, you see a progression of, you know, sort of them lying on this, you know, sort of curve where it's increasing in this direction. There are some cases which we miss, but it is pretty good given that we did no pre-processing on this. Everything was, there were no thresholds used, nothing of that sort, you know. We collected the data, same set of processes throughout, and we see that sort of shift. The thing is that if we look at these same normal epithelial cells using image analysis in, uh, at the time, so we don't, we don't see anything. You know, we see all of them cluttered about. So we looked at basically three different types. So we looked at morphological features. We looked at some statistical features. We looked at textural features. So they are sort of listed here if you are interested. But these were not the only ones. We, you know, there were a number of them we looked at. And none of them actually showed anything for normal appearing epithelial cells. Because what Nanonam is doing, it's directly quantifying the nuclear architecture without any post-processing. While here we are working with resolutions which are limited by the diffraction. So if we can go below the diffraction limit, then maybe you, you might start seeing something. But the disadvantage there is that you are working with systems that, which are very expensive. And, you know, so and very hard to maintain, especially in a clinical context. So the expensive, low throughput, so it's hard to do. So yeah, it, was, it just was kind of looking positive. So the question became, okay, we are able to track this progression. Can we say anything about prediction, actual prediction? Because we are identifying the changes, we are not really predicting right now. So there we moved on to MD Nalanam, and we looked at mean depth resolved OPD. And, um, this is not published work yet, but we looked at uh, 110 IBD patients, which were recruited prospectively, and colon biopsies were taken, which were used for histopathological exam. And two extra rectal biopsies were taken, which were normal appearing. So this is what Nanonam uses, because we were not sure if we could use this at the time, because some might have. So to have a proper control of what we're doing, we looked at that. And so, yeah, so based on the pathological diagnosis, uh, we divided them into two groups, low risk. If they had any sort of dysplasia or adenoma, anything coming from any of the uh, colonoscopies they went through, and high risk if, uh, sorry, um, sorry, that was high risk if they had that, and low risk if they didn't sh uh, show anything. And this is this, uh, you know, what we got. So we had 73 patients for low risk, which is to be expected, and high risk 37, which actually is large by any, if you were to take a population, only generally about 5% of the people eventually go on. So, so this is a small group. So um, the thing what we did was to do prediction. We took this group, we took that group, split it into two, okay, each of them. And uh, one group from here, one group from here, we put together as the training set. One group from here, one, the other two groups, we put as the testing set. For the training set, we now, if you look at the numbers, they are uneven. So we bootstrapped it so that they should have similar numbers. Okay. Is that, okay, so we did, uh, you know, uh, sampling with replacement in the training set. And then we trained a classifier, we uh, support vector machine classifier, and we applied it to our testing set. And this is the result we get. So um, again, normal appearing epithelium. And our area under the curve is 0.83. These red lines indicate the 95% confidence interval. So what we did was when we did the bootstrapping, we did it a number of times, you know, different settings. And we plotted our seekers for all of them. And all of them lie within this, um, this area 95% of the time. And so you see that we get sensitivity of about 80% and the specificity maybe around, of, I don't know, 75, 76% from normal appearing. So it looks there is scope for understanding. So again, this is un unpublished. We did, you know, just to see what is happening. And it looks very promising. The next thing was that we wanted to, so we have got identifying progression we have got predicting progression, 
The other is that, so for example, if you're looking at protein expressions, anything of that sort, you can say, oh, you know, this is an expression level, people have scales, you can say something about it. Can we say something similar about nanonar measurements? That can we develop a scale which can talk in terms of, you know, nanonar expression levels or something like that to say that what is happening? So essentially, that's related to the idea of identifying risk spaces, what we call, where these low risk groups and high risk groups sort of separate out. So, um, in order to do that, so this is something very preliminary, what we did. Um, we took our nuclei measurements, so we had about 500 nuclei for a single patient, sort of unraveled it, opened it, and formed this data matrix where the nuclei are sort of along the Y, so typical you know, data analysis uh, thing. And we took um, eigen decomposition of this, the first eigen, you know, vector of it, and we did it for all patients to form this eigenspace, okay, of maximal changes which are happening. From those eigenspaces, we calculated a nonlinear embedding using local tangent space alignment. So basically, this is a high-dimensional space. We sort of tried to learn a local embedding of this space in a three-dimensional setting. So if we apply a function to that 3D local embedded manifold, we can generate this data, or the eigenspace of this data. And um, when we did that, we get a result something like that. So essentially, these two low risk and high risk, the colors look a bit odd, but the blue thing is actually green and the red is red. So you see that we are seeing a separation along the z direction of this nonlinear manifold which we have learned, and which seem to indicate um, there is progression. But the thing is, there's a bit of cheating involved here because we know which patients are low risk and which patients are high risk. So we just wanted to see here, first of all, that are there is there potential of such risk spaces to exist? The ideal would be that there are patients you do this local embedding, and it automatically just separates them out. But we didn't have enough patient population. There were a lot of issues. So this is uh, you know, what, what, what we got. So but still, it looks quite promising. So the idea is that if we can identify these sort of planes which exist, so any expression of or, you know, any patient, we can lay them on one of these uh, sort of you know, planes and say that oh, low risk, high risk. These are the expression levels. Because the idea is that eventually, uh, which I say somewhere here, that can be extended to other disease models. And if you have a scale which sort of holds across in different you know, uh, disease model, it makes sense. If it's, it's changing all the time, you can't really say anything. So, but, uh, so yeah, uh, that's about it. So in summary, we have created this nanonam approach, which uh, is able to measure this, these particular properties which I talked about with nanometer scale sensitivity and increase, it associates increased risk, sorry, increased risk in patients is associated with this condensing of the nuclear architecture. We are able to do it at a stage which is prior to histopathology and um, we are at least seeing some positive results in terms of predicting future colon cancer. Mm -hmm. Going. So, with that um, acknowledgement, uh, you know, I was working with Young on this stuff, and of course, Randy and Doug, who were instrumental in a lot of this work. And um, Hua was, did a lot of instrumentation part, Justin, a lot of data collection. Um, David is a surgeon, and um, she, uh, they, him and Jana actually did a lot of data collection, patient management, and all that sort of stuff. And Jian Yu was responsible for the mice model. That's how we got. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Couple of questions. Yeah, sure. Nice talk. Thank um, you. One question uh, is: Do you have any idea as to uh, what you are detecting? Um, if you found uh, an association between measurements yeah. and direction? Yeah, so uh, that is one of our fundamental things because what we are measuring is in the realm of physical optics where things exist in terms of this refractive index. So we are not talking in terms of organelles within a nucleus. 
So um, that partly is the reason why we actually talk about identifying these risk spaces to say that where they lie. But fundamentally what we are measuring is a property of the nucleus. And that property is related to its refractive index, which is related to the condensation effects, you know, chromatin condensation. So Yang actually is doing some work, for example, where she is trying to relate these changes which are happening through storm imaging, which is a super resolution modality, to changes of condensation effects in heterochromatin and euchromatin, for example, to see if there are associations. But the thing is, the moment you start associating, depending on the person you talk to, they want to draw an association with what you're doing and what expression they are looking at. So, but I think it's the right, that's the track to go on in order to see that if there are linkages which are stronger than correlation, maybe causal in some ways. But we're not sure yet, but yeah, that is something that we can say. Yeah. And then also, uh, you can do this by saying that you only look at some basic procedures related to the practice. Right. right now you're using biopsies, obviously. No, so the thing is that if a patient comes in and, you know, he has, he's an IBD patient, he'll be coming in every year in order to make sure he doesn't develop, say, cancer or anything of that sort. Can we reduce that amount? So come 10 years, not every five, not every or every two years, and every stuff like that, you know. But don't come. You don't have any risk. Yeah, please. Uh, very nice talk. Very Thank interesting. you. Thanks. I do not quite understand most of the stuff that you say because I'm not, sure. you know, computational. I don't do computer science. So I was wondering if this big strategy could be extended to any other kinds of diagnosis. Right. Um, I think we can because we have tried looking at breast cancer a bit. We tried looking at cervical cancer and stuff. But at the time, our approach wasn't well, you know, developed enough to uh, to come to any very strong conclusions. But one of the things about this approach is that it is good at looking at early stage or pre-cancerous stages because what it's measuring are small changes. So when you have sort of metastatic or tumor related sort of changes, then those things might overwhelm. But of course there's potential. There's I mean we would eventually like to sort of see if yes, yes, it can be yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 No, we are not. So, yeah, we are looking, we are see really sectioned, uh, so we have these, yeah. So, like, the whole nucleus uh, section, whatever, uh, anywhere getting, where it is everything that's Yeah, so we get a bunch of different planes. So, depending on the section thickness we have, so we're using 5 micron, for example, here. So, we sort of step through it, and we optically section it. So, not physically, but optically. And for each of those layers, we compute our statistics. And so we look at the entire volume within that, uh, thing, within within where we are. And one of the reasons is that uh, we are doing the staining thing afterwards is that because this approach is sensitive but not doesn't generate a lot of contrast, we can't always very clearly say, oh, this is the nucleus. So we have to use the secondary sort of H and E staining to define where the nucleus is. Yeah. So I understand that um, you have. Yeah, I mean, it was something we did, we, yeah, kind of, I'm not sure it's going on, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> so this is uh, your previous work? Or yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could correlate the prediction with actual, so you have this low-risk patients, uh -huh. and you have the data on your, uh -huh. uh, and uh -huh. then you follow that patient over time, then there's a come point where you Yes. And oh, you're saying the moment when it happens, that's what you're talking about? Yeah, okay. you predict that transformation, and then clinically it will detect much later on, so right now, what we are doing actually is we're looking at normal epithelium cells, yeah. epithelial cells, the nucleus and the nuclei uh, there, and we are performing that prediction. So these, especially in the retrospective study, what we did. Yes. 
sort of made emphasized by Bush. So when we call these uh, patients low risk, we know they're low risk, but looking at an earlier time point. So we are sort of you know predicting, we're saying, oh, these patients will be low risk. Yeah, but you do not have samples of these patients when they actually became high risk. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Uh, I mean, the only thing we did close to that was um, the mouse model thing, where you know we can yeah. look at mice and go. Yeah. But it is, I mean, it doesn't always transfer. I mean, yeah. that's the thing always with these murin models that you can do a lot of things. But when it comes to patients, everything changes. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Maybe the two slides we put this way, then we had a high. This, this keep going now. Sorry, because it's a clear thing that uh, low risk, yeah. Oh, that's too far. Uh, oh, I think maybe you're talking about uh, yeah. this. Yeah. The low risk group and the high the risk. The graph which had the entropy of the mean value and the mean value. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So things like you know, this lower circle, which uh, the you know, high risk patients surrounded by all the low risk. Yeah. Is that a misclassification uh, yeah. of the data point? Yeah. These are what happens. Yeah. I mean, so what we did was um, we didn't. This is not. We didn't do any classification. We just put them on. You know, we did our measurements and put them on this thing. On you know, on a basically two D feature vector. This is what it is. We're right. laying it out, and this is how they arrange. So yeah, if we were to do a classification on it, then yeah, we would get this problem. Now, I'm wondering yeah. if the lowest risk was a uh, was a sign on based on clinical measurements. Uh, yeah, so for these patients, we know their final outcome. Oh, you know the final outcome. So this, yeah, so that was the thing that we wanted to test, like, if we are actually getting progression or we are just capturing some random so, thing. So then, can you tell, uh, can you say more about this the red dot in the sea of blue triangles? No, oh. I we don't know, yeah, honestly, yeah. And uh, so, um, when you are showing the shift in the graphs, right, so... Uh, so maybe the other one. This, yeah. Here, then you actually introduce this idea. Yeah. So all the tails having an overlap, what does it mean? I think there are some UTI which are common. Yeah, so common. what it is showing here, so this generally is the range. Uh, so the nanonar measurements can go up to maybe 90 or 100 nanometers, because after that, what you have at the Fourier amplitude, it sort of bleeds into, uh, sorry, the Fourier phase bleeds into the Fourier amplitude, so it'll get removed. So, yeah, these tails indicate that you always have these sort of outlier effects, so you can't completely rely on the measurements. So you are trying to think of them as outliers? Well, not outliers. So I don't think so. We make any claim. What I'm saying is that maybe that's the wrong choice of word, actually. But, yeah, we did not say anything from uh, the tails because these particular, especially these tail points, we were getting in all sorts of situations. So no matter what kind of cells you're looking at, we always had this kind of tail effect. And I don't know. So when you compute the mean, you drop the tail and compute the mean? No, you... no, we compute for the entire thing. So okay. the skewness affects that, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, the pictures where you had inset, uh, and then you would show us low and high. Uh, values. So, yeah, like that. Yeah. And then, so um, there seem to be some other spatial thing where then the nearby epithelial cells seem to have the same sort of patterning. Uh, you mean so? So it is dark blue on one and dark. So blue. Uh, we actually were looking at condensation effects. So we didn't look at the blue regions. We actually just considered the red right. regions. So that is one UPI. Yeah, yeah, all these are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if it is a dark red in one UPI, it's also dark red in the nearby UPI. Uh, yes. Many, yeah, many times it is like that. Although sometimes it is not, for example, here, but yeah, that seems to be the tendency. But I think that is primarily because we are looking at these, well, we are looking at these normal appearing uh, epithelial nuclei, but from patients which have a certain homogeneity in their existence, because right now they haven't become dysplastic or sort of cancerous yet. So, you know, the immature state which occurs with cancer hasn't happened yet. So there's a homogeneity in terms of their existence, but they, the homogeneity sort of exists at different planes. And I think this is what affects this so cancer. Uh, um, we didn't do that. Maybe there is. Yeah, that's quite possible, actually. But yeah, here we did not uh, do because 
um, we were looking around, you know, the lumen sort of areas and this structure, you know, we didn't have like, for example, stromal effects and that sort of thing. So we were just looking at that. So yeah, we didn't really look at cell to cell communication, but I think it might be possible. Yeah. The last slide you had some embedding results at the time. data being not too much data, but being yeah, yeah. sparse data. But it seems that the low risk has uh, two different groups. Yeah, so basically, each uh, of them actually has two planes. So this is the low risk plane one here and one here, and the yeah. same with red. But I feel that's partly due to the effect of the principal component and the, and the negative front. This sort of uh, width, uh, the gap tells me that the behavior is very different from those low risk groups. It, it is quite possible. We, this is very preliminary, so I didn't really look at what is, you know, what, what is the effect or what is the reason behind it. This is that we wanted to see if they actually are separated. There sort of lies this, you know, manifold like uh, space, a nonlinear place where these separations lie, or we could identify one another. The problem partly also was that when you generate the eigenspace, it's a very sparse space. So when you do manifold learning and a lot of the stuff, you have to be careful because you can come to conclusions which might be just absolutely gibberish, actually. So, um, so that's why we sort of incorporated knowledge that we were in low risk and high risk groups. But um, yeah. 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 Yeah, that, I think that is the thing which uh, yeah, we were trying to. So basically because the system itself is a one-time sort of cost, and, so, and all the um, ingredients in that are very cheap, or relatively cheap, rather, I should say. Uh, and um, so once you buy it, you can just use it, and you can use it within a clinical setting. And um, the throughput is relatively high, so yeah, so that was the idea that you use it. So you don't affect the clinical sort of, you know, whatever the... Um, you know, the steps in the clinical process are that, yeah, so you just come in between the pathologist, after the pathologist, and, um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.